Okay, uh, our next speaker is Chris Wood. He is a principal engineer at Lenovo and has been working on BMC firmware for 16 years, but just recently joined the OpenBMC community. Good day, everybody. Uh, good to be here. Uh, I was here at the hackathon, actually not here, but in, I guess it was Beaverton last year. Got to meet uh, a lot of you, see a lot of friendly, familiar faces. Um, we were there for our first time, Lenovo was, uh, to get on board with OpenBMC. And I guess I should just stand here where you can hear me better. So in the, in the time since then, we've done a few POCs in-house and just um, wanted to share with you some of the work that we've done on some of our, our products that normally go out with our Lenovo branded BMC firmware, but we're trying to uh, explore in, in the realm of OpenBMC. So the most of this talk is all about OpenBMC on, on Lenovo branded hardware. Um, specifically the SR950. So I'll get in, get into some of that. Um, so the first step is the, you know, the, the, the Perly based systems, S, the SR950 is a Perly based system. And we, we build our hardware with the a speed pilot four chip. Um, so how many of you here have used the a speed pilot four or have heard of it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. 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 Um, <clears throat> A lot of customers have it, so that's good. <laughs> anyway, um, the, the Pilot 4 chip uh, goes on all of our Perly platforms. And uh, the first step in getting OpenBMC working is to enable the silicon. So we worked with the uh, A-Speed hardware engineers who, who are here today and, uh, and firmware engineers to, to get the uh, you know, OpenBMC support, mostly the uh, primarily getting the drivers uh, on the, uh, the, you know, in the OpenBMC development uh, framework. So, uh, what did what did that involve? The the A speed BSP or SDK comes with a lot of drivers that are primarily written for testing the hardware, validating the hardware. Um, so, a lot of the drivers needed to be touched to 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 work in the OpenBMC framework. And so what I've got here is a very crude uh, block diagram. I did get permission to show a much more detailed one. But um, anyway, I went with this one because it conveys the information. Um, basically, everything that's in green were all of the drivers that had to be touched to some degree or another, um, including the, the basic the, the chip enablement uh, for, the, for the processor. Um, <clears throat> this, this represented many months of work to get going. And uh, you can see, you could go out to the GitHub. I provided the GitHub link. Um, on a speeds account to to pull that branch um, so you could actually play with this yourself if you had a pilot for BSP um, or a Lenovo service but the only hardware changes we had to make were the adding the a 32 megabyte spyrom we, we boot from a smaller spyrom so that's that hardware change plus the associated straps so that was step one which was not an insignificant step it took many months to get going uh, we did initially enable it on one of our uh, lower end servers, the SR650, which is a two socket, but this endeavor was to see what we could get going on the SR950. Um, so that was a joint joint operation with ASP. Um, the SR950, just to give you a brief introduction about it, it's kind of our flagship server. And this isn't a sales pitch about our server. I just need to give you a little bit of background about what we chose. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's a very dense system. So it's a Xeon based family. Uh, the pearly generation of processors. Um, it's got a lot of I.O. It's got 16 PCIe slots, four power supplies. Um, it's highly modularized. So we have CPU trays. And you can see there we support eight sockets, um, 96 DIMMs. Uh, it's pretty storage rich and a lot of fans. So what this means for OpenBMC is lots of sensors and a lot of uh, potential you know, D-Bus activity. So this is one of the reasons we were interested in targeting this to see how well OpenBMC scales out to a, a very dense platform. Um, also, I wanted to point out the, that was audio. Okay, I wanted to, can you guys still hear me? Okay, yeah, I just want to point out the main board has, of course, the Pilot 4, which we talked about, and an FPGA. The system FPGA is, uh, it's common to all our platforms and it's, uh, it's a very significant piece of, of our hardware. So I wanted to give it a little bit of a, a sound bite um, because enabling the FPGA was also part of getting the, the, um, the OpenBMC to boot and run. 
right? This is where power control is. This is where a lot of inventory comes from and some temperature sensors and fan control. So we've offloaded a lot of things onto the FPGA. So um, FPGAs, I don't know how common they are in most of the building blocks of BMCs, but obviously they've been around for a very long time. Um, we chose an FPGA for this system because frankly, there's a lot of IO on it and it's um, for what it's capable of doing, it's low cost, right? You can, you can change the fabric after you spin the boards. Um, we have 120 voltage regulators on or VRD devices in the eight socket config of this platform. So with the power okay and the power good, um, there's you know 240 plus IO. Uh, that's that's putting a strain on a on a typical BMC just for GPIO. It's also got um, as an FPGA, it's more real time, right? So you're responding in nanoseconds uh, without uh, you know program loops inside. Um, this is useful for power sequencing. Right, so when, when you have a power fault, you need to back off those rails fast enough. You've got to do it fast enough so that you don't get biasing. Uh, this is to protect your hardware. So the FPGA is quick enough to do that across all these rails. Um, also, there's some LCD control. So on this server, we have a little LCD front panel up front, and the screen needs to be painted. Um, uh, you don't want your BMC constantly painting pixels on the screen. Right? So um, the FPGA takes care of that. There, there's a long list of other things you might use an FPGA for um, that fall under the category of real-time offloading. Right? Anything you can, if you wire an FPGA up to your BMC and you have a fast enough link, low enough latency, you can, um, you know, it's kind of a cool little playground to imagine what, what software function you want to push out to the FPGA. It doesn't have to be hardware function. You could accelerate a lot of things with that. Um, so I'll leave that to your imagination. The other th thing you might want to offload is... Uh, Time zero. So if you want to boot the server a little faster, what sort of things can you can you have what the BMC could normally do, but you want the BMC doing other things. Um, so it's not necessarily real time, but you want to do it in parallel while you're booting. So this is, you know, we may have to configure the VRDs based on the processor SKU that's in the system. Um, and we want to enable power as quickly as possible so the customer doesn't plug it in and have to wait four and a half minutes or whatever for their BMC to be ready before they can turn it on. Um, the LCD initialization too, right? Before video, you get you get nice little LCD telling you that the server's working properly. Um, inventory, uh, there's a lot of DIMMs out here on, well, not on this board, but on the CPU boards. So one could imagine you can wire that FPJ and all its IO into multiple I2C buses to pre-harvest SPD content or you know other, other things, right? Then the BMC can come back and ask the FPJ what changed. So a lot of value in putting an FPJ with a BMC. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so. The, the other thing is that it's it's a field updatable. I think I touched on that. It's it's hardware that kind of changes after you build your board. So you can you can offload function. Let's say you find some piece of function that's broken and you don't have time to respin silicon, whether it's the BMC or something else, right? You you uh, you can push stuff onto the FPGA and reduce your dependence on on other silicon. Okay, so what did we get done with the SR950? And this is this is the part that's made me nervous because we didn't actually get everything we wanted to do completed before today, but uh, we are still working on it, right? So we do have a made of Lenovo layer where we have support for the SR950 and the SR850. The SR650 is there as well. I just didn't list it. It's under a different name, but um, yeah, right now it's an internal Git repo because it's not mature enough to share with the rest of the world, but the intention is to make it available at some point. Um, the uh, It does include support for the system FPGA. We, we were able to obviously build the code. That's not really challenging, although sometimes it is. Um, we, you know, there, there was some discussion about... Um, how you can deal with in the lab when you're developing on a system that has a Spyrom, the Spyrom emulators, th those are great. We've used those. In this particular solution, we've gone a different route. We have a, a Raspberry Pi that basically has the flash ROM from uh, I think the Chromium project that we pull that in and we can use that from the command line to, um, to read the ROM contents and then flash the ROM contents without having to go up and touch this thing. So we can stick the Raspberry Pi on the server and throw it in a rack and walk away and SSH into the Raspberry Pi and have our way with the SPI ROM without having to, 
to do anything physical with the server. Um, so this allows us to recover and, and analyze in the case we, we corrupt our spy ROM, which we did quite a bit going from a four megabyte ROM to 32 megabyte, we had some issues with three byte, four byte translation. Um, uh, let's see. So we, we've got, you know, IPMI up and running. So this is kind of a testament to the stability of OpenBMC in general, right? So you, you build it, you put it on your chip, it comes up and um, you get IPMI, right? Um, there's not a lot more you have to do in order to get the core IPMI function. So that was working. And then some basic sensors came up automatically, a couple of th three voltage sensors and six fan sensors, uh, nothing, nothing behind them, right? So our goal was to implement all these sensors for all the devices, right? But um, uh, we, we didn't get that done. But not to leave you hanging, we do have some, um, these are things that we were intending to do, so we're gonna share that with you now, because I think this, this speaks to um, a story that's often overlooked uh, in performance. And so our, our perspective here was that this is gonna be a performance sort of survey of the capabilities. Um, when we look at our, uh, when we go to our customers, a lot of our customers ask us how fast the BMC boots, right? What's its, uh, you know, on an AC cycle, how long does it take before IPMI responds? How long before the web responds and Redfish, et cetera? Um, warm resets and uh, uh, first boot scenarios after an AC flat, sorry, after a, a firmware update. These are all different scenarios uh, across which these times matter to customers. And so, um, we wanted to, to profile OpenBMC in this category. And you can see we got some numbers from the IPMI stack that, that was running in the base image um, with the, the Pilot4 support, of course. Um, where did I get the time to live expected numbers, right? So that comes from our history uh, and what our customers seem to be tolerant. These are upper thresholds of what a lot of our customers are tolerant of. You go beyond that, defects are written, um, code has to be respun or you know, it's, it's not a good day. So those are pretty high numbers. Um, I'm, I think it would be interesting if we had a set of criteria for within OpenBMC to say, these are our thresholds, right? Um, obviously it can be configuration dependent. You put a high end server with a lot of sensors can take a little longer, but what, what should that be? Uh, should there be, there be sort of a formula based on how many DIMMs? Um, what are the factors involved? What should the upper limits be? Um, similarly, the, the, thing, the same thing can be said about service response times. So it's not just how long it took your IPMI stack to come up, but how responsive is it? To get a sensor, a complete sensor listing, if that takes a minute and a half, that's not very good. Um, if the round trip time for an IPMI command is beyond a certain amount of time, what should that time be? That's not good. Um, because, you know, a lot of our customers, when we analyze the IPMI traffic, there's quite a bit of IPMI traffic. There can be many thousands of IPMI commands that are issued every minute, right? So these performance numbers matter. Um, uh, walking, you know, other examples, like walking the uh, Redfish tree, if you wanna go and just pull the whole schema, pull all of the, the URLs in Redfish, that can take a while, especially if there's a lot of uh, elements there like logs and, and uh, um, web login page. This is something that that we've, we've profiled um, on, a, on our side of things, how long does it take for the login page to show up? How long before you can actually type in your username credentials? And then how long after you hit enter before the, uh, the homepage is loaded, right? So a lot of those are a balance between just, not just BMC performance, but network performance, which we can't really control a lot of that. There are some variables we can control, but client performance. If you've written your JavaScript poorly, that can take a lot longer, right? So, um, and how you're expressing your, your web, you know, widgets that can, that can take a lot longer. Um, these are things that it might be important for the client side to profile. Another thing that's very important is flashing times. And I should also say flash sizes, but mostly everything I'm here, I'm focused on here is uh, time wise, um, flash times. So, you know, the three basic metrics are the time to transfer the image and the time to update the image and then activation, which is usually deferred till later. Customers are okay to go ahead and push the image down and um, defer the activation until some other time when there's a maintenance window, um, especially if it takes a long time to transfer the image. They wanna be able to do that while the server remains 100% functional. So these are the metrics that we're interested in gathering so we need some sort of system to gather this. You could you could look external to the box. That's that's 
that should definitely be done. And it's probably the most obvious thing to do is to write, write some sort of automated test harness to go. And every time you release code to run through these paces um, and find out where you sit. Um, but what I'm going to suggest is that part of keeping your performance hygiene is, is uh, an internal system inside the BMC. It's not meant to replace an external system, but it can augment it. It can give you a better view of what happens when you fail to meet your IPMI boot time, boot readiness time, your IPMI time to live. Um, if, you, if you have a test case that just tells you, oh, this release of code uh, it broke that 90 second budget, what do you do next? Okay, so now you've got to go get all this data from the BMC, reproduce it. Um, well, <laughs> you got to reproduce it or plug in serial debug or do some sort of analysis. All right, so the, the point of, of this proposal here is that the BMC can sort of self-monitor and um, um, yeah, so I'll just walk through the example. Um, the idea is that we use a hardware free running timer initialized at in, in startup early assembly Sorry, early startup code in assembly. So we start one of the timers. Um, we, we run it at about uh, one tick, uh, 10 ticks per second. So 100 milliseconds per tick. Because for this kind of work, you don't, you're looking at how long a service takes to come up. You don't necessarily need a lot of granularity or fine granularity. Um, we, we don't have a real-time clock at time zero. We're in early assembly code. And maybe we want to profile some of that early code. So we're going to wait until... We have the real-time clock and then try to uh, fix up all those times after the fact um, so that it's nice and human readable when you get one of the, the reports from this boot perf. Um, we log all of these snapshot entries to temp. Um, that's where we do it today. I would, I would recommend logging it to a temp file system. Um, there's some discussion. I know there's a telemetry work group and um, you know, this is something that we would like to work with them to see that that this profiling data could be made available through the telemetry um, system as well. So what is exactly BootPerf? Um, uh, it's basically just an API using this hardware timer that's available throughout all phases of the code, early assembly, U-boot, C, uh, the kernel, uh, drivers, and user space. Um, you could link it to a C program. You could um, call it from a shell script. There's a boot perf binary as well that you can run from a shell script. And I apologize, that's a little, well, it's bigger over here, I guess, but yeah, it's a little small. Um, just an example of the entry uh, of, of the API where um, it's going to make use of a region in SRAM that's available immediately and uh, initialize it and then load it with Every time you call it, basically, it's going to snapshot the, the free running timer and stick it in memory alongside the uh, uh, a code that uniquely identifies the checkpoint that you've added to your source. Right? So it's a very simple call. It's very low overhead. You're not passing a lot of data. Um, we, we do pass two pieces of data. We pass sort of a type and a subtype. Um, and the... The idea behind that is we have components. You might have an IPMI stack you want to profile. You might have Redfish stack. So in you know large firmware components can have their own type identifier, and subtypes can be common codes like zero for startup. Um, maybe uh, you could you could pick a number like two fifty five for um, fully up and running, and then you can use any subtype you want in between to profile whatever of the startup code or throughout the lifetime of that that uh, that service whatever uh, metrics you want to uh, publish. You could call this API with, you know, just create a header file and um, define the values yourself. So here's an example of the output after a boot of a system that shows uh, just a little debug here where it shows the sync. Uh, we use timer five in this example. Timer five happened to have that 16 bit value. And um, the real time clock at that time was equal to that. And um, this, this was printed out after the real time was synced. So you see the date and time on the right is all backwards notated, right? Reverse notated. So you can look at any, any of the data and, and you know, it's, it's a human readable time. So it's showing there that at uh, six seconds, the boot started. So in this particular case, U-boot finished in six seconds. That's where we happened to profile it. We said there's no point in saying when you started, you know that that's zero. Um, but you can say when the boot started. And then we validate our kernel, and that's at 8.3 seconds. And, well, that took uh, you know 1.1 seconds to complete. 
um, anyway, you can fill this up any way you want. Um, the, the value here is, as I said earlier, to be able to, um, once you know something has exceeded a number, you can go look at this data and get a lot more granularity. You wouldn't necessarily uh, test for each one of these. You might just test only for IPMI commands ready. And if that blew up, if that was really long, then you look at this and you can find out what other things were long that led up to that, right? It might not have been that last step that took a long time. Okay, so this is this is a, yeah, a way to get the data after the fact. Um, there's another concept that you can take from this and that's self-reporting where the BMC itself and developers can um, at build time specify what they think these thresholds should be. So if IPMI ready should be up in 90 seconds or maybe you want yours to be up in 15 seconds, that's great. Um, you could, you can create a config file. In this case, I gave an example of JSON that says, I want um, this particular service to be available in 300 seconds. So the time to live, it's in the domain of that timer running at one tick every, um, well, 10 ticks a second. So that had better appear by that amount of time. And if it didn't, then I have an action. I could generate a log. Um, I could mark it as a failure. And what does that mean? Uh, basically, you have the service that's looking at these checkpoints and looking um, against these times that are specified in this JSON file. And when something breaks the budget, it takes these actions. Um, this allows the BMC to self-report. There would be an OEM IPMI command that you can issue. Uh, you could expose this through a variety of interfaces. I just chose OEM IPMI to find out, like imagine a test harness that is doing flashing. Maybe they don't really care so much about performance, but um, that's not the primary function for their, their test. But along the way, they want to know if, if the flashing, if the if they broke any budget for the, the time constraints that were set. Um, this command would just give them a simple indicator that there was a failure. And additional payload data would, would tell them the breakdown of what failed. Then they could pull this log and, and get more information. So it's pretty simple. Um, the other idea is that you can have the BMC identify the scenario. So the BMC hardware is very capable of telling us what the reset sources were, whether it's because power was lost or a user initiate, initiated a reset command. If our stack's robust enough, we can tell whether that was through Redfish or IPMI, um, or there was a watchdog timer. There are all sorts of scenarios that resets can occur. It could be because you were just flashed and then you reset. Um, you know, it's noteworthy that the first boot after a flash, there's a lot more maintenance to do on your way up. So um, you, you might have a different threshold for that scenario. So it's good to, to be able to identify that in the firmware and then <laughs> compare it against the, that scenario's uh, metric for success. Um, okay, well, any questions on the performance hygiene? Yep. So a uh, couple of things, uh, when you said that, uh, do I need to have that library included and be support in every, every phase of the code? Yeah, actually, and, and one of our implementations of this, it's a very thin header file, uh, but, but yeah, you, right, you could implement it as a library and you would have to have it in every phase of boot, right? So our implementation of this is it looks the the pound include basically determines whether it's being built for U-boot or whether it's being built for the kernel or whether it's being built for user space. So it's the same source file. But do you have patches for which goes into the kernel to support this? Yeah, not not publicly, but yes, we have that, and that's just getting to what we're wanting to do. Yes, that's the goal. And uh, as you said, the self re self performance reporting, right? Right. Add up to the Continuously right. Yeah, that's true. Certainly, uh, by looking at the experiment, you you change the outcome, right? But um, the idea here, what we found in the years and years that we've released firmware is that um, it's easy to not pay attention to these things. And um, I think it's worth paying a little bit of price to, to monitor them. Um, and yeah, I, I think that the you're using a hardware timer you're using a very simple API. The code path is very is very small. Once I should I should have mentioned once we move uh, into the kernel, we have access to more memory. Um, well, in in early code, the idea is that you're not going to have that many checkpoints. So initially, you're loading you're logging them to SRAM, but these BMCs have limited SRAM. So when you transition to the kernel, then a region of memory is allocated and it gets logged there. Um, 
but it can be a region that's not managed by the kernel, right? So it's not necessarily memory alloc. Um, you, you can just be a chunk of DRAM out there that is just as fast. Well, it's not just as fast as SRAM, but you get there's a couple more IO cycles, but it's it's fast. It's not gonna you it'll be negligible. The the mon so that's the logging portion of it. The monitoring, um, yeah, that's gonna take some time. But again, I think I think it's probably worth it in order to have uh, good hygiene. So you're you're aware of when you break a budget. Um, I, I would expect the overall flow to go something like you, you you write a new piece of code and you you check it into and you test with it and you find that you've broken certain things. You go back and check, make sure that your code is well written. Uh, there's no bugs in it, for example. But you realize now that, that there was some inherent impact to power on time that you just didn't you weren't aware of. So at least it brought you brought that to your attention. Right. Um, so yeah, so they. I, so this was just a one-off implementation sort of uh, in, the, in the general sense. I think that they could be strings. They could be um, defined by, you know, you could have your own definition for them. They're associated with a string at some point, right? So, so we can generate this log. Whoop, I keep going the wrong way. So we could generate this log here for the description. Um, the IPMI command you could, you could issue and it would return the checkpoints that exceeded their threshold, they wouldn't have the string names, for example. I mean, you, we could do it in a way that it you can query the strings. Um, that'd probably be more portable, right? So you don't actually have to have the source code. The value that like a C was 0 x 0 9, is that fixed or I can have my own custom? Yeah, you could have your own things. And this is this is something, so if I were to jump to the very end, it's kind of a call to action. We, we would like to, so, sponsor a work group on performance hygiene, right? So this is where we're, we're sharing with you some of our ideas, things that we've implemented one off that I think the we could, if we could put into the open BMC and get some input from everybody on what, it, you know, how to make it a little bit more robust. Like that That's our goal, right? So obviously change is welcome. Um, yes. Um, in our implementation, it didn't. It does not, but um, you you could you could migrate to if you know, for example, you're going to shut down. You could move it over to long-term storage. Um, you could have something that's running in the background, or you, you have an, a chance every time boot perf is called or the API is called. You could implement something to uh, copy it if it gets to a certain size or under different conditions. Sure, sure, absolutely. <clears throat> because of one failed component, which is kind of running in a loop. Right. right? Your log may get bigger. That's true. Bigger. Yeah, and, and, and we've, we've seen that before, right? So you could, you could implement some rate limiting. Um, yeah, right. You can rotate the logs from temp to uh, long-term file storage, compress along the way, right? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good problem. Yes, sir. No, we haven't. Uh, so system D analyze already has a profiling tool built into system D that lets you know mm -hmm. when the kernel loads all the application start times, yep. uh, when system D execs it. So it has a lot of this functionality already. Perfect. Yeah. So, I mean, it, the, the intent of this is to span all boot stages, right? So it gets the early assembly, it gets the U boot as well. Um, and it, right. So it, the, the the intent here was to be able to cover all phases of the boot, but and if you're not using System D too, of course. But yeah. and I'll be more granular with the current applications. One thing that we found is that something we found is that sometimes when you're really analyzing performance problems, you know, at a top level, it can look like wow, this this program is launched at time zero, and then 55 seconds later, it came up and started responding to requests, what the hell happened in those 55 seconds? And, and bootproof has come in handy for us where you know, we found that this errant condition caused us to go off into a for loop over here that we sit and spun for 35 seconds. And that, that was what was causing us to, to break our performance budget. 
Uh, so another benefit to this is that you can get inside your application and you can really profile your application um, as at, as granular of a level as you need. You can use compiler flags to increase the granularity or decrease the granularity. Um, but that, that's another benefit here uh, that system D analyze didn't provide to us. Okay. So we'll go to the next thing. Uh, one of the, um, <clears throat> sensor number limitations, it's been mentioned a few times here and we did some poking around. Um, we've, we ran into the sensor number limitation years and years ago, and this is sort of the approach that we've taken. So I wanted to just share that with the community. Um, obviously you have the eight bit value for sensor number, uh, but there's the LUN number. And I, I, there's, there's some really good conversations that are out there on the open BMC forums about this, but I didn't see where they landed on this particular solution. And instead what I see is uh, typical suggestions are o OEM implementations, right? Where you have OEM IPMI commands and handlers to get the sensor numbers. So what we found is that this works and this works with IPMI tool, which is a pretty common uh, utility that customers use um, for managing their BMCs whenever they're doing IPMI. So because they're limited to 255, um, uh, well, that's where you have your limitation. So uh, in the SDRs type one, two, and three records, there are the, the there's a, a LUN field and I've got a pointer to it. It's the second second image on the right. Um, that LUN field can be used to associate that sensor with different LUNs, right? I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we know that LUN2 is reserved for message messaging, uh, or sorry, the message bridging, the get uh, and send event uh, commands. This leaves you with, since sensor 255 is reserved, you have about 768, 65 sensors, if I did my math right. Um, the there's a little snippet of code over there on IPMI tool that shows where it it's basically pulling the SDR from the BMC and looking at that LUN record. This is what it does today. And then it will go back to the BMC to get the sensor reading and it will use that LUN to get that sensor reading. So you actually will implement the sensors to get sensor data on a variety of LUNs as you've defined your sensors or spread them out across the LUN buckets. Um, but the, the IPMI tool will actually use that LUN from the SDR record to, to do that interrogation of the sensor reading. It works seamlessly. So um, this gets us well beyond the 255 sensor limit. Um, for our server, I think, and Connor can help me out here with the number, I think we were around 392 sensors. Um, so now we have had some customers that require us to stay within one line. Maybe they have an older version of, uh, of an IPMI, like IPMI util, for example, that does not play well with LUN numbers. Um, I'll, I'll just, IPMI util doesn't play well with lots of things, but uh, there, you know, one suggestion is if you're limited to IPMI is to become, get a little bit more clever with um, using the use of event data two and event data three, not necessarily suggesting you go OEM with it, but DIM sensors, for example, we have 96 of them. So you can group them, right? You can, you can have one sensor for a set of them and then use the event data to, or you could use one sensor for all of them and use the event data to carry the, uh, the DIM number event data three, and that's standard IPMI specification. So that frees up a lot of things. Um, and if you want more than that, then maybe it's time to move to Redfish. Um, yeah, so I wanted to share that with the community. What has been your experience with using sensor numbers above 255? Anybody reach that limit? No? Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, <laughs> there's always that. Um, right, yeah, so this works seamlessly. I think there have been some patches to IPMI tool uh, a long time ago that fixed some bugs around this, but yeah, it's been working for a long time. Okay. Um, so another thing that we worked on in getting, um, you know, OpenBMC going on the Pilot 4 was the enablement of QEMU for the Pilot 4 chip. 
something we're excited to do. Um, so we worked on that in-house in, in Lenovo. And this is that same map with a few different colors on it, kind of giving you the status of where we are. Um, we found this to be very useful. I, I think maybe OpenBMC is used primarily for getting the kernel up and running, um, people that don't necessarily have the hardware available to them. Um, our approach was to try to enable a little bit more simulation of the system. There are obvious down pitfalls to that. You can get really excited about some, some, some simulation that's just not really gonna work as well as you think. But um, we wanted to do more than just the kernel because there's a lot of value there. In running your pre-compiled binaries, just plopping it right here and letting it rip. And and you can do some profiling here. You can do a lot of, of good things with QEMU. So we started with a Pilot 4 model. We got the processor up and running, and then we started filling out some peripherals. And you can see the green is what we've done. Uh, the yellow is sort of in progress um, in that we've done a lot of it, enough of it for our internal stack to be able to boot. Um, and what's planned is you know in blue. So we'd like to be able to fan it out more. And you see that some of the system interfaces like KCS are planned. So um, how do we go about simulating the host OS? Obviously, we're not diving into running UFI on, on QEMU. At least maybe that's not obvious, but that's not where I would think we'd go. Um, but this is for simulating the, the BMC itself. And you can have all of the, the back end of these peripherals uh, go out to some socket server if you wish, and then you can simulate your system however you want. Um, so some of the limitations that we had on the things that are in green, for example, are that, uh, um, we, the, the pilot four uses the tulip network controller. Um, we, so instead of spending the time standing that up, which is not supported in QEMU, the last, the last I looked, um, you know, we can use the E1000, which is, and that's just a matter of using a different driver in the kernel. Um, we did take the PWM attack and, and route it out to an API. This is what I was referring to earlier, where you could go to a socket server and then simulate that with a dashboard if you want. Um, uh, and whether that's a graphical dashboard or some automated test harness. Um, and, uh, the reason I put that as a limitation is because I'm making the assumption that the PWM signals and the TAC, TAC inputs are being used for like on a fan, which might not always be the case. Um, uh, and uh, the DDR controller, we didn't implement all the registers there. That's just claiming I/O space enough to get us past DDR in it. Um, so we're we're picking our battles as to what we simulate, which I think is a, um, a sane way to move forward. We don't we're not trying to re em emulate everything at the register level. Um, you'll notice that one new block showed up there that wasn't in the Pilot 4 block diagram, and that's the system FPGA, which is obviously not part of the Pilot 4. So that is part of the, the, the QEMU project as well that we're doing um, when we go into emulating the system. So I'll move that on. Um, so we have preliminary support for the SR950 and the SR650 in our QEMU code base, and we have the FPGA um, we communicate with FPGA over SPI. It's a, it's not a terribly complicated protocol, but it's, it's fairly robust. And, and, um, so all of that we've, we've actually got modeled the FPGA itself. And you can't really see this because it's so small, but like I show the invocation for how we kick off uh, QEMU on the SR950 with a pilot for using our XCC code. And then on the bottom using open BMC and, um, Really all we're doing there is changing the system because we have to have a different size Spyrom and in the building blocks of the BMC that we're simulating. But then also we uh, we pass in the FPGA, um, the FPGA image. It's the raw binary that we create for our FPGA that we send to the manufacturing to flash on the chip. I'm not simulating the FPGA by looking at the bin file, right? I'm looking inside the bin file for a signature, basically. And then and then the FPGA model in QEMU is behaving accordingly. So ideally, if your model is thorough enough at a behavioral level, then you can change the FPGA image from version to version and your model will follow, your response will follow. Um, yeah. Um, where are we with this on OpenBMC? I said we got our, our internal uh, firmware booting. Uh, the OpenBMC it right now is hanging in U-boot, so we're in the middle of debugging that. Um, but 
you know, debugging in QEMU is pretty straightforward, um, just a matter of time. So our plan is to get that out to you know, that pilot for model uh, in QEMU upstreamed um, when we get the kinks worked out. So we have to, we want to get OpenBMC booting all the way up. And I think we're close on that because of the other peripherals that are actually running. And then we need a bit of, a bit of cleanup. Right? Um, I think I talked a little bit about some of the value of the QEMU that uh, what, I, what I found while, while working on that port was right away we could see where there were a lot of wasted IO cycles in our early startup code. Um, going out to registers more times than needed um, and you trace the code and find out why, oh gosh, we're calling this routine way too many times. Um, things you wouldn't notice if you're just going for functional correctness. Um, and you might not notice if you're just measuring time, right? Because it's very fast to go through maybe spy initialization every time you go to the chip, but you don't need to. Um, so it, it, it opens up your eyes to things that are doing if you start looking at things at the IO level, at the register IO interaction level um, or the, the bus interface level. So if you tap into the spy bus and you can see the commands going back and forth on QEMU, that's pretty useful. Um, you can do snapshots with this. So uh, if you are simulating your system and uh, you have a bug, you could share that with other people, right? And then they can help you debug that problem. They don't necessarily need the hardware. That's assuming you can reproduce the problem with the simulator, but um, that's one of the values of this. Um, another value and perhaps the primary reason that we wanted to go in here to get into QEMU is um, resource limitations. So we've got 512 megabytes of DDR4 soldered down I'd love to run Valgrind on some of our applications in the real real world. Obviously, it's going to slow down a lot, but you need a lot more memory to do that. There are a lot of memory profilers we've thrown at our at our code, right? Um, Val if you want to throw many of them at it, you need a lot more memory, right? So short of um, replacing that BGA DDR4 chip with uh, a much bigger one, if you can get it running in QEMU, Great, and it's not really that hard to change the amount of memory you have available to you um, in QEMU. Uh, let's see, so, and then, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the automation testing can be done at a lower level. Um, but just another caveat here to be careful what your expectations are. Time domains and simulations are problems. Um, your test harness has to be aware of a lot of those things, so, um, I think you just have to, the the word of caution is to just be mindful of what you're going to simulate and what the value of it is, and before you spend too much time trying to write a model for something with hopes you're going to get a lot of benefit out of it. Um, uh, just think about a lot of that stuff up front. That's pretty vague, but uh, uh, we're not trying to do everything with this model. So uh, what we'd like to do next is, you know, having said all of this stuff and shared with you what we've done so far, you know, enabling um, the Pilot 4 on a variety of platforms, right? So in, in OpenBMC and QEMU is we'd like to, you know, you know, being new to OpenBMC, so I will try to sponsor, well, not try to, but sponsor or begin a work group for the performance monitoring, sounds like there might be some interesting comments that we can we can work on here. Um, the, as I mentioned earlier, being able to make use of the telemetry for making this data available. If it's, a, if it's just a file that you can pull off externally and you don't necessarily need the OEM IPMI command, that's great. So uh, we look forward to kind of partnering with the telemetry guys on that. Uh, the multi-line sensor support. So um, enabling that in OpenBMC, um, would be a good thing to have, right? So how many people are doing that sort of LUN solution today in OpenBMC? We didn't see where, where you created the sensor that you could actually specify the LUN it's associated with. Yeah. Yeah. So we'd like to work on trying to upstream something that, that the community could benefit from. Yeah, perfect. Oh, uh, at the time? Oh, oh, at the, oh, oh, at the boundary of the sensor limit. Yeah, perfect. So we are, we are, we just started looking at, um, any 
Okay. Yeah, yeah. Great. Thanks for your talk. Uh, I've done lots of work on the A speed QMU model upstream, and Perfect. I do lots of kind of work for OpenBMC in general. Um, and I use QMU a lot. It's, it's great. Uh, we write lots of models for stuff that we don't have silicon for. Um, we bought the 2600 up in QMU before we had hardware and, and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, thanks for talking about QMU and, and talking about how good it is. Um, just a few comments. You, the Ethernet driver, uh, Ethernet model you're trying to do mm -hmm. is PCI. So if your BMC doesn't have PCI, you'll have trouble. Okay. But come talk to me afterwards. I've got some ideas for you. Sure. Yeah. Um, and similarly with the U-boot hanging, are you using upstream or are you using the open BMC fork? We're, we're using the, uh, the A-speed off the A-speed repo that supports Pilot 4, because that's not upstream yet. OK, cool. I'll be so, interested in seeing which code base that is. Yeah, yeah. So that's, I think, off of, uh, what, THUD 419? Sorry, I'm talking about the QMU branch. Oh, the QMU branch. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I don't remember the version number. I should have put that in the charts. That's cool. I pulled um, it a while ago. We updated. Um, who I don't want to guess. I can, yeah, we can talk no afterwards. Um, and so the, the A-speed QMU model that's upstream has is, is become pretty high quality. And the, the, A, the QMU maintainer points to our model when he's telling other people how to build a machine, cool. which is good. But it's also really annoying when I'm trying to work out what to do because there's no reference. So yeah, that was one of the things we learned with, A, with QMU is if you look, there's a variety of APIs that I, I, I suppose has evolved over time. And there's a lot of machine implementations that um, use one or the other <laughs> of, of uh, the, the calls to instantiate other components. And so we patterned it after the ASP 2500. Cool. And uh, which we found to be one of the more mature ones. Yeah, no, we, we spent a bit of time on that. It's, it's very useful. So the OpenBMC CI runs against a QMU model for every commit cool. that goes in, um, which is great when it passes. And it's really frustrating when someone makes a kernel change that doesn't get supported. Okay. But yeah. it's something we're working through. So thank you. Okay. Great, thank you. Yeah. Talk about that uh, system FPGA collecting the inventory on parallel and the sure. system. Sure. Same example. Is it configurable or is it like uh, always does? Well, it, 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 the, the point is to say that you can use an FPGA for something like that, right? So your implementation would be specific to you. Oh, all right. uh, mostly what I'm trying to say in, in introducing the FPGA at all is that it was a bit of effort in order to get it going with OpenBMC, but uh, that for high end systems like this, um, there's plenty of opportunity to offload from the BMC onto something, right? So I don't know, I don't, maybe one could predict that uh, FPGAs are maybe more likely to appear in the common building block hardware that is a BMC that goes down onto a server. With that many IOs for VRDs, for example, you need, you need something, right? Faster yeah. than code. Yeah. But at the same time, like the, the BMC has to collect those data from the system and PC later on. Correct. And once we configure this uh, model, so DMC will always be talking to the system FPGA. Sure, and, and in our particular case, that's what we do. We, we go and we we go talk to the FPJ to get dem SPD, okay. and we pull that. It's very it's much faster. Yeah, and uh, and where has the benefit of us not being on the I2C bus, playing playing poorly with the CPU, right? I2C or SM bus controller. Nice. There's some advantages. Okay. Thank you very much.